On today's Prophecy in the News, we're going to discuss a metaphysical door, a stargate of sorts, um, a, an entrance from this time-space continuum into the eternal now, what we call heaven. Jesus begins in John chapter 10 by saying, He that entereth into the door of the sheepfold um, is the shepherd of the sheep. And he who climbs up some other way is a thief and a robber. And finally he says, I am the door. Well, from this point, we're going over to John's other writing, the book of the Revelation. And Gary Stearman has written an article for our November edition of Prophecy in the News magazine entitled, A Door to Heaven. Gary, tell us about this door. Well, J.R., the door functions not only as a metaphor, but really as an allegory. And we're going to get into this today. And when I say allegory, uh, I mean a, a, an allegory is a, uh, a representative narrative using a figure or a metaphor of some kind to illustrate a story so that you can understand what's going on. We have the door in the book of the Revelation. And let's take the most obvious example uh, in Revelation chapter 4. Right after we have the illustration of the seven churches, we have this. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard uh, was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And so John goes through a door. Well, J.R., you and I know that that's no ordinary door. That's right. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we are told, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Yeah with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. Well, that descending from heaven is an opening of this door, is it not? It's a window or a door, an aperture, uh, I call it a portal, whatever you want to call it. A door is probably the best word we can use. And it's not just a rift in the time-space continuum, it's actually a fashioned door, deliberately there, not by some accident of some black hole somewhere. Exactly. And in a moment we're going to talk about when this door opens because it's very important I think to understand when the door swings open metaphorically and John is granted access into another dimension. But people I think tend to forget that there are two other mentions of a door just prior to this in the preceding chapter. For example, we have the Church of Philadelphia, which is commonly thought of as the Church of Grace in the latter days that extends the gospel to the world, uh, representing the period of about 1700 to 1900 when the gospel began to go forth again. And we read this in Revelation 3, 8, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. So the Philadelphian church has an open door set before it. Now, yes. again, this is a metaphor, but it's also an allegory because then you depict someone actually walking through that door out into the world with the gospel, and yes. the Lord opens this door. I think it's the same door from a slightly different point of view. Well, we have talked about this door in the past as being the door to mission, the mission field. Yes. Uh, we recall William Carey, the father of modern missions, who came out of this great revival in Europe uh, to become the first missionary. And uh, from him came all the other missionaries in the great missionary movement to spread the gospel, take the gospel. Then there was, there was evangelism, mm. you know, the great rallies. Um, uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon in his 5,000 seat auditorium in the Metropolitan Tabernacle in yes. London. And uh, there was Billy Sunday, D.L. Moody and Billy Sunday and then Billy Graham and all these great evangelistic meetings. And then we have radio and, and the, little, the little broadcast, you know, back in the 1930s. Howdy friends, this is your, and preach the oh, gospel. Preach you the know? gospel. Lester Roloff and, and, uh, uh, all of the other great preachers of the past and of course of today because radio, uh, Christian radio is still very much alive. And then we came along with television to reach the world and now the internet and you know our broadcast can be seen. We've, we, we've gotten emails this past week from Bosnia 
mm. from Israel, yes. from the Fiji Islands, from Australia, people all over the world that watch our program on the Internet. So, yes, we have an open door. But, Gary, this door also is the door of the rapture because he says to Philadelphia, I will keep you from the hour of temptation that is coming upon all the world. The door then opens, shall we say, before a Christian uh, with, with Christ's uh, approval. That door opens up, and its opening is not just a single moment. It's, it's a protracted kind of an event. And J.R., here's the proof of it, because when you come to the end of the church age, you mentioned all the great church expanse in the latter day, radio, TV. The church became very, very wealthy in the process. And the end of the church, as given in the illustration of the Laodicean church, is a church that has gotten so wealthy that it has become a business. It is no longer really preoccupied with spreading the word. It, rather, it is uh, completely absorbed in, in, in enriching itself. To that church, Jesus says this in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. Same door, it's yeah. now shut. Yes, <laughs> but he is knocking. He's not. Now, what is interesting to me, Gary, is that even though there are over 1,500 different denominations of Christianity, there's only two views. There's the liberal and the conservative. Yeah. And they actually, uh, these, these two views represent Philadelphia and Laodicea. They do. Basically. We have the liberal Christian whose liberality extends to even in politics. And then we have the conservative whose, whose theology even governs their political views. But basically there are two views. Uh, you know, it's like night and day, like good and evil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe I sh shouldn't quite well, go that far, but I'm saying that Jesus is knocking on the door of the liberal and he's saying, anybody in there? Or, or, yeah, or. <laughs> that's true. Let, let me in. You know what it is. In, in another, put it another way. Let me expand on it. It's it's the battle between faith and reason. Mm -hmm. uh, to the liberal, human reason supersedes faith. Yes. To the conservative, faith supersedes reason. In other words, by faith we accept the things that are written in the literal Word of God. The liberal might come along and say, "Well." You know, I don't believe just everything in the Bible. For example, this right here, I just don't believe that's divinely inspired. And he begins yeah. to pick the part, pick the Bible in pieces, and suddenly that door slams shut. Mm -hmm. And this is the point. And you know, I, I can even see this in, uh, among the rabbis. We have both liberals and conservatives among the rabbis. I sat down with a, uh, a famous rabbi, um, or at least whose father was famous. Um, some time back and began to discuss the book of Genesis with him, chapter 1 and so on. And it's amazing to me that everything that the Bible, that, that he referred to in the Bible, meant something other than what it said. Mm. To him, it meant something other than what it said. <laughs> now that's a really good point to, to sit on for a moment because <clears throat> we're saying that the door means something other than just a plain door, but by that we're not obliterating its meaning, we're expanding its meaning. Yes. Whereas gentlemen you were talking to literally yeah, Didn't takes believe anything. Yeah, just, just didn't right. believe anything. So uh, when we're talking metaphorically or allegorically, we're not altering the meaning of Scripture, we're trying to understand what it's saying. And what we have here is a door, if you will, suspended between heaven and earth. And that door is an open door to the faithful. It's a closed door to the man of reason. But John, to John, J.R., that door became entirely something else. It actually did open. And Jesus, we know from John 10, is the door. And when Jesus said, come up here, I, I have some things to show you. Mm -hmm. uh, John went through the door. So open or closed or or completely open, I guess we could say in the case of John, mm -hmm. it's the door. So back in the first century, exiled to the island of Patmos on a Roman penal colony, he steps through that door and suddenly yes. he's in the future. He is 
he enters that door at the same time every other believer in Jesus Christ enters that door. He experienced the rapture from the first century. At that moment, when he stepped through the door, he was able to see a multidimensional eternal now, uh, mm. past, present, and future. And, and when he goes through the book of Revelation, uh, Gary, it sounds like he's just taking one set of scenes and looking at it from this vantage point and then looking mm. at it from that vantage point and looking at it from that vantage point. At least that seems to be what he's doing. A and to uh, our mortal eyes, when he shifts position or shifts perspective, we say, well, parts of this match parts of the other, and this seems to be the same as this, and how can I put all this together? Well, the answer is, you've got to be in another dimension to put all this together. And yeah, so we're going to look at it from the eternal now, don't that's you? That's exactly right. Well, whether or not you uh, look at the door as allegorical, uh, let me put it to you this way. Pilgrim's Progress, if you've ever read Pilgrim's Progress, you know that a door in Pilgrim's Progress is the representation of the Christian walk. It's a spiritual journey through biblical prophecy. It's a trip through the sinful world uh, wherein Pilgrim uh, battles his own sinful nature. And by the way, if you've read Pilgrim's Progress, J.R., you know that there's the wicked gate. And mm -hmm. Pilgrim goes through the wicked gate on his way mm -hmm. to the beautiful city. He has to enter a door. He, uh, John Bunyan understood this beautiful allegory of the Christian walk. That door can be closed, it can be open, or it can be fully open, allowing one access into heaven. And of course, we're all going there, we're all going through that door that is the righteous in Christ. Yeah. <laughs> Hal Lindsey once told me that we're all groping in the darkness looking for the light switch. <laughs> well, I tell you when, you, when you find the light switch and you flip it, it's sitting right next to a door. That's right. <laughs> it may not turn the light on. It may open the door. Maybe a crack or maybe and we're gone. Yeah, maybe. Now, if you have an objection to, to the word allegory, uh, Paul used an allegory at one point in his writing, Book of Galatians. Mm -hmm. uh, the allegory uh, is found in many places in Scripture. For example, uh, Joseph is a figure of Christ. Can we use the word allegory? He's an allegory of Christ. That is, his life is. Uh, he, was, uh, he was, if you will, uh, slain though he was, was not really slain, and his bloody robe was taken back as proof of that he was dead. And, mm -hmm. and in, in essence, he was raised from the dead, raised out of the pit. He went down to Egypt. He interceded for his brethren. You know, in, his, in, in effect, he rose up, had a kind of a resurrection into newness of life, and he was able to redeem his brethren. And J.R., mm -hmm. the longer you look at Joseph, the more you realize he's an allegory of Christ. And he saved him from a seven-year tribulation period, too, didn't he? <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And um, so that's true. Joseph is an allegory of Christ, even though we have nowhere in the Bible that we are told that. It's just plain as the nose on your face. Oh, it is. is. And so when we begin to talk about the hereafter, <clears throat> the allegorical door, we remember the words of Christ to John. Revelation 1.19, uh, Jesus told John, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Which takes us back to that door. Uh, when that door opened, John could see the things hereafter. And the hereafter was a a view of the world such as we have never seen. It was a view of the world that offers perspectives that in this limited time-space continuum we occupy presently, we simply can't see. Uh, we can try and we can come close, but J.R. reading the Bible, we were talking about this mm -hmm. a moment ago, is, is sort of like feeling your way along and you've just about got it and then it moves a little bit and you feel your way along and you've just about got it and it moves again. In other words, the Lord has written the Bible in such a way that you'll never have uh, the answers, not in this world, but you will come so close mm -hmm. and and you'll, you'll be excited in the, prospe in the process. When John stepped through that door, 
or was in the spirit immediately passed that door into the eternal now. He saw God sitting upon the throne with the scrolls in his hand. He saw the four horsemen of the apocalypse. He saw the seven seals broken, mm -hmm. the events of the tribulation period, the second coming of Christ in power and great glory, the millennial reign of Christ and following that, the holy city of New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. And th that takes at least a thousand years and yet boom, 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 he, he saw it. And uh, in, in my thinking, um, he was able to write all of this down so that in future generations, mm -hmm. Christians would be able to read it and to get a glimpse, though maybe not understand it. You know, remember John Calvin said, when I read the book of Revelation, it gives me a headache. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and so it's true that the closer we get to the end, the more we're going to be able to understand. Now, J.R., when, when he went through the door, and we've mentioned this before, but it's worth touching on again, he saw a judicial setting in heaven in which the Lamb uh, was formally uh, able to come forward and receive a, a, an indictment, which was the seven-sealed scroll. And when he opened the scroll, which basically was an indictment of the world system, the first thing that happened in that hereafter uh, we find in Revelation chapter 6, the opening of the first seal, the riding forth of the white horse, the second seal, the red horse, the third seal, the black horse, the fourth seal, the horse of death, that pale green horse. J.R., we have here a time sequence that happened after this door was opened. So in some way, even though we can't fully see it, we can partially understand that there's a timeline here, mm -hmm. a definite prophetic timeline. And the only thing we can say at this point is those horses sure do look like the beginning of the tribulation, which in other scripture would be Ezekiel's battle, for example, in, in Ezekiel 38, when Gog comes into the Middle East and, and uh, starts a series of campaigns which evolve into a world cataclysm. And we see that right here in Revelation chapter 6. So can we say that as soon as the door opens for John, the next thing <laughs> historically to happen after that is the battle of Gog? Yes. In James chapter 5, we are told of a, an economic collapse worldwide. Go to now, you rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted. Your gold and silver is cankered. When we get down to verse 9, he says, Behold, the judge standeth before the door. So, Gary, the first thing he saw, mm -hmm. John saw, when he entered through the door, was the judge sitting upon the throne with a scroll in his hand, sealed with seven seals. The mm -hmm. judge is before the door. And so, immediately after the rapture, then the judgment begins. Uh, Gary, that's a pre-tribulation rapture. Oh, yes, it is, without any question. And if we regard James as uh, the 12 tribes immersed in the difficulties of the tribulation, the judge standing at the door could be Christ poised to reveal himself at the end of the tribulation. So depending on how you want to view that, uh, he's actually coming through the door into this dimension, which of course he is going to do. Mm -hmm. So we have the battle of Gog and Magog pending. It's just waiting. Just waiting. So, uh, you know, the most important thing is that we need to know Jesus Christ, our personal Savior, and get the gospel message out to as many people as possible so that we can win as many people. I want you to know this old ship is sinking. Man the lifeboats, folks. Man the lifeboats. <laughs> wow. That's, that's really the, the bottom line, isn't it? It is. Get as many people saved as we can. Let's review just a little bit. Returning to that door of Revelation 4.1, we want to ask the natural question. If that door does, in fact, represent a break in time or a break in time space, can we say that it represents the rapture of the church? In other words, it's a, an actual figure or allegory of the rapture of the church. Uh, if so, at what point in time does it open, given the fact that... Uh, as we mentioned ago, Ezekiel's battle comes at the very beginning of the tribulation. Can we state with uh, some certainty 
that the rapture occurs before this battle, uh, perhaps shortly before. We don't know the time sequence, but look at this sequence. First, John envisions the era of the seven churches, that is the age of the church, uh, and, and it's very clear. Secondly, he is raptured, Revelation 4.1. He's taken to heaven where he sees the throne, the 24 elders, the opening of this judgment scroll. Third, he lays out the opening of the tribulation, and that would be the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So, Jr., we've got a beautiful time sequence, as you said a minute ago, illustrating the mm -hmm. pre-trib rapture of the church. And it could be a vantage point. Ah. <laughs> you yeah. know? There's a movie out uh, called Vantage Point. I think that's the name of it anyway. Where the President of the United States goes to France, gives a speech. He's shot, and then somebody blows up the platform. Then the movie backs up the tape and goes at the same scene again, but from a different vantage point. Mm -hmm. And then it backs up the tape and goes through the same scene again from another vantage point. It does this about 20 times, seems like, at least a dozen times, throughout the two hours of the movie. And it's all the same scene, the same five or six or seven minute scene shot over and over and over again from the vantage point of a Secret Service mm -hmm. man, from the vantage point of a terrorist, from the vantage point of the president, and so on. Perhaps this is what John is seeing here in this multi-dimensional vantage point as he opens the door, walks through, sees the book of Revelation, comes back and writes it all down. And maybe that's why John Calvin got a headache. <laughs> he was trying to put all those vantage points into one perspective and couldn't do it. Well, he wouldn't be the first and he wouldn't be the last because uh, I'm convinced that, uh, that John's uh, revelation is a uh, hyperspace revelation, if you will. Mm -hmm. It can only be thoroughly understood from the other side. But, J.R., look at this. Today, we're observing the rapid strengthening of the Russian military. They're moving into the Middle East even as we speak. At the yes. same time, we're witnessing the globalization of the economy, the, uh, the, r the radical altering of the world financial system mm -hmm. into that system that Daniel talked about, uh, where there would be ten kings ruling the global economy. Uh, we're seeing all of these things happen, and we know that all of those things have to be gel or come into one uh, one view before mm -hmm. uh, the great and terrible day of the Lord. J.R., if we're seeing him right now, then we're close to what John was seeing. We are close. We are so close, folks. It's just incredible what's happening. Um, in fact, when, it, when all of these various vantage points come together, we come right down to the calling forth of this world government. Mm. out of the sea of nations and we suddenly see the middle of the tribulation period at least what we think is the middle of the tribulation period and when the beast comes to life and the mark is demanded in the flesh of the hand of the forehead that is the ultimate goal of the globalists of the one world economy and you know this next month our president is going to be sitting down with about 20 leaders of the world and trying to hammer out this. Uh, my thinking is the script's already written, Gary. Mm. This, is, this is all manipulated. It's amazing oh to yes. me that every four years when we come to election time, the economy falls apart. They've been doing this ever since Nixon uh, put a wage and pr freeze price, you mem remember? Yes, and I then do. there were long lines at the gas pump. And then uh, Carter had the 22 percent interest rates. Right. And, and uh, uh, it, it's, they've, they've been going through this scenario, preparing, preparing, getting ready, uh, just setting the mindset of all the people so that they finally, out of disgust, say, help, 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 somebody help us. JR, that's another program. But, you know, yep. Paul said the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. And JR, you know, a thief doesn't come through the door. He comes through a back window. That's right. He that climbeth that some other way. Well, this is JR Church and Gary Stearman. Until next time, keep looking up.